So I just want to welcome everyone who's here so far. Um, welcome to our LISA virtual event. My name is Allison Neuror and I am co-president of LISA and I also want to take this time to introduce my leadership team. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Um, hi, I'm Chelsea Rizzolo. Um, I'm on leadership team two. Um, I'm the webmaster and social media person. And co-president. And co-president. <laughs> And I'm Eden Mazur Schwartz. I'm the secretary of LISA. Great. So I just want to run through some housekeeping items before we get started with our guest speaker. Um, so this event is being held by LISA, the Library and Information Science Student Association. We are Rutgers University's student chapter of the American Library Association. Everyone in the program is automatically a member and we encourage all of you to be on the lookout for events like this so that you can be involved. Um, you can find our events and information on our webpage, on the Rutgers MI student Facebook page, and also in your emails. So keep a lookout for future announcements. Um, we're also recruiting for leadership positions starting in the fall. And we have the form up on our Facebook page, on the Facebook page and the website. So please consider filling out our interest survey. Um, it is open to online students if you're interested. And you can always reach out to us, any of us with uh, any questions. So tonight, this talk will be about 45 minutes total. We have a 30 minute talk with our speaker and then a Q&A for 15 minutes. And we ask that if you have questions and you wanna ask them, please put them in the chat box. Um, uh, my co-president, Chelsea, will be monitoring the chat and we will ask the questions at the end. And you'll also have time to compose your questions at the end, but um, post any questions that you have in the chat box as we go along. Um, so right now, I just want to introduce our guest speaker. We have Dr. Stephanie Mikadish. She's a data analyst at the Library of Congress. And prior to this position, she supported instruction and research as the user engagement and assessment librarian at the John Cotton Dana Library at Rutgers University in Newark and the assistant student supervisor in the circulation department of Alexander Library at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She earned her PhD, MLIS, and BA at Rutgers. So hello, uh, Dr. Mikadish, and welcome to LISA's virtual meeting. We're happy to have you here. And, uh, good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. So I hope that uh, you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy in New Jersey or wherever it is you're dialing in from. Uh, now, to be honest, it feels a little weird to be here talking about my career path uh, because, as you can see, I've only had a few jobs in LIS. So compared to the last social speaker, uh, Nancy Cranick, I've really only barely begun my career. But after listening to her talk, uh, at first I was a little like, uh, you know, what do I have to share compared to that? But of course, it's not really a competition. And I think that hearing from a variety of people about their careers has been and still is really helpful to me. In fact, uh, when I was listening to her talk, I realized that a lot of the advice that she gave and the stories that she told resonated with me, even though I'm sure I'm never going to be ALA president or anything like that. Now, the theme of her talk was networking. And I'll talk a little bit about that because it's certainly important. But the other things that really stood out to me were just how many opportunities there are out there. And in a way, I think that for those entering the field now, there are just so many paths that your career can go. Another thing which this pandemic has really highlighted is just how things are changing so quickly. So what I'd like to share with you tonight is a bit about how I have navigated my career uh, going from one job to the next. Because really your career, it's not really just about the jobs that you have. So hopefully you can see on the screen, I've highlighted those in uh, you know, blue, but it's also going to be those opportunities that you encounter along the way. Now, some of those opportunities you're gonna take, and those are the ones that are in green, and then almost equally important uh, are the ones that you don't take, and those are the red ones. Now, a question that I often hear is, well, how do I know if this is going to be the right job for me or the right project? Well whatever this opportunity is, is it gonna help or is it gonna harm my choices for a successful career? Now, the academic in me says, well, it depends. And that's true to an extent, but it's not particularly helpful. I think that there are ways uh, to make better decisions. And when I say better, I mean decisions that you're 
necessarily confident are going to be the right ones. So what has worked for me has been to identify what is most valuable or useful for me uh, to develop my career and then to pursue those opportunities and most closely align with those values. So I hope that my sharing some insight into that process will help you identify what matters to you and because I think that's really what's going to help you navigate your next steps. So how do you define those values? Well, I think for most people it starts before they even think of going to library school. So you see here I've kind of like pulled my career path, you know, in emojis. Uh, but, you know, you have to start somewhere. And for most people that starts before they even think about going to library school, right? So you're going to encounter a lot of people who came into the LIS field after having other careers. And I've met people who, you know, did probably like the predictable things like teachers or programmers, uh, maybe even attorneys. And then there are some people who came from like really different careers like acting or modeling. And there are also people who knew from the time that they were very young, so even as young as 10 years old, that they wanted to be librarians. And well, they became librarians and they were great librarians. When I was 10, I didn't think that I wanted to be a librarian. I actually thought that I wanted to be an officer in the US Army. The way I figured when I was 10, I would get to help people, I get to travel, I get a free education, and I was pretty much going to be guaranteed a job after getting that free education. And for 10 year old Steph in the late 90s, this was pretty much the dream. And then, well, when I was 17, uh, my dream was starting to come true, and I got accepted actually at a military academy. So there I am, on the one on the left. And there's a lot of things you can say about the military, but one thing that is absolutely true is that there is a right way and of course several wrong ways to do almost everything and that includes how to be a good soldier and an officer so to be a good soldier uh, there are two well really three things you had to do you had to be able to shoot move and communicate in order to be a good officer you had to really care for your subordinates and even though after a couple of years i decided that the military was just not for me this idea that you had to be good at these tasks and also care for the people around you stuck with me. Of course, being an excellent marksman isn't necessarily going to get you that LAS job. Uh, so I had to translate those values a bit. And what they became was being good at whatever skills were necessary uh, to be successful at the job, but then also to have a flexibility um, or a mobility to be able to expand into other areas. It was also important to communicate or network uh, with those in that area and the related ones. And for me, the most important thing uh, and what I judged really every opportunity by was that I would be able to find and help create a supportive environment. So that's kind of where I started from uh, before I even began the LIS career. But, you know, as you know, being students to start in the LIS career, you got to get your master's. So I realized, okay, I'm going to go get my master's. And I looked at a few schools, but, you know, already going to Rutgers and then already being in New Jersey, it kind of narrowed the choices down uh, quite a bit. And I decided that, uh, you know, I wanted to go to Rutgers. And that was because, you know, I talked to some people uh, who, had, you know, were working in the library at least, and they, they really enjoyed it. And uh, I figured, yeah, you know, I'm good at some of the skills being a librarian, I can definitely like read. Uh, I can definitely find information. I was pretty good at finding things on the internet. So I'm like, okay, I'm set. I can do this. And of course, getting the formal education uh, was going to give me the skills to be successful whenever library job I wanted to get. And then I'd also get to meet people. So I thought that was all great. While I was applying for uh, the program, I also applied for a job at the Alexander Library. Uh, this was just an entry level job. It was a staff job in the circulation department. And to be honest, I really didn't know anything about libraries because I was like, okay, if I'm working in an academic library, then I'm going to get like those skills that I'll need to get, you know, a professional librarian job. Uh, and then I'll also get to meet people who are in the library industry. But what really, you know, spoke to me when I took this opportunity was when I went for the interview, you know, I liked the panel. They were very friendly and outgoing, but I was a little nervous because I had already been accepted to the master's program at Rutgers. And I said, well, 
you know, I got accepted to the program. Uh, you know, if I have to like adjust my schedule or take classes, is this something I can do? Um, and the good part was that the person who became my supervisor, Jeff, he actually had just started the program himself. And he said, oh no, that's no problem. A lot of people at Rutgers, you know, who even on the staff side or have gotten their library degree at Rutgers. And like, we're actually very excited that you want to get your degree. So I said, okay, great. This is meeting all my criteria. And being a circulation staff member, I was in that job for about nine years. Uh, it was a great opportunity um, because working in circulation, I felt like I really got to learn about all the different things that the library did. I got to interact with the professional librarians, but I also got to work a lot with um, the other people in the staff roles, so like the tech people, um, and then even some people in administration. And they were pretty supportive at Rutgers. Um, you know, there was a lot of training, and then I even got to be involved in some of the training because, you know, I was supervising students. So overall, it was a positive experience. And yes, they did pay for the education uh, for the master's, and they also allowed me to, you know, adjust my schedule. The other good thing, which I didn't realize, is that working at a big place like Rutgers were all the opportunities that were there. Um, and pretty much as long as I was doing my job, if they, if I wanted to join a committee, uh, like the marketing committee, they were all for that. So I got to volunteer for a lot of things. I also was voluntold to do a lot of things as well. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people also voluntold. And I think just being at Rutgers, um, just being in New Jersey, People, you know, were just like, well, sometimes you got to do these things, but we're going to make the best of it. And so that was something that, you know, I looked for in other jobs. Now, when I was working as a staff member, I was also working, you know, working on my master's degree. And I decided that I wanted to get more involved in LISA. Uh, so it just so happened that, you know, when I was in my second year of the program, uh, the opportunity to run for list of president came up and I ran for it. Uh, and it was like a great experience. I had been uh, an officer for student organizations at the undergraduate level. So I already knew that I could probably do a lot of things uh, that a president needs to do at, you know, at the graduate level. And also because I was a co-president that made things a little easier. Uh, it also allowed me to develop some skills um, because, you know, before I had been more like a vice president or more like a secretary, I hadn't been a president, but only for a semester. So it really helped me to kind of hone those leadership and just, you know, skills to get things done, to get events organized. Uh, and that included a trip to the Library of Congress, um, which I heard, you know, you still do. So hopefully, you know, when the pandemic lifts, we'll get an opportunity and maybe I'll get to see some of you in person. Of course, it was also great for networking. And the team that I had was just, you know, so supportive. And I still talk to some of them today. When I graduated, um, I had like a choice to make, you know, did I want to become a librarian or did I want to, you know, pursue other paths? I kind of decided that I was interested in being an academic librarian. Uh, and what that meant was because even though I had my master's degree, if I wanted to be an academic librarian at some place like Rutgers, I was going to need to get a second degree. So I already figured I could probably do, you know, the stuff that was required to be a librarian. But I wasn't sure, you know, what type of librarian I would qualify to be, if I would have the flexibility to really get that second master's degree, because I'd heard that some places weren't as uh, flexible with their scheduling. Um, as it had been for me being a staff member. And then also if I was going for tenure, uh, you know, then I'd have to be publishing and working and then also working on a second master's. It really seemed like a lot. So I wasn't sure about the flexibility and I wasn't sure if they would support, you know, me taking that next step. And none of the jobs that I was really seeing out there seemed like they'd be a good fit. So the good thing about being at Rutgers is that in addition to the master's program, we also have a stellar PhD program. And when I was a master's student, one of the classes that was in one way one of the most difficult and like the scariest class was one that uh, it was kind of a joint venture with people in the master's program in LIS, but also people that were in the business school, in the computer uh, science department, and also PhD students from the the Sky PhD program. So 
talking to them and being in class is pretty intimidating because, you know, they were PhD students, but they were actually a really friendly bunch. And, you know, talking to them about the program, uh, and I already liked the department. Uh, Marie Radford was actually my advisor when I was a master's student. She said she would definitely, you know, advise me if I was a PhD student. So already I felt like it was going to be a supportive environment. I knew I had done well at the master's level and that I'd probably be able to do, you know, the coursework at least for the PhD. And it would also give me the skills uh, if I wanted to pursue a career in librarianship, but also if I wanted to move into something like teaching. And then Part of being a PhD student is to do your own research and to kind of put yourself out there um, at conferences, um, writing journal articles. So I figured it also helped me network no matter where my career path took me. So really, it was sort of a no brainer uh, going into the PhD program. Now, in addition to being in the PhD program, uh, there were also opportunities. We also had a student group. Um, it's called the Doctoral Student Association or the DSA. And when I was in my second year in the program, um, some of my other friends were running for, you know, the e-board and they were like, hey, do you want to, you know, be on the board? And I said, well, I've already been like a president, like a secretary uh, and a treasurer. And they're like, okay, that's great. We really need a treasurer. So I was like, okay, I'll help you deal with like, you know, the Rutgers budgeting system. I, I can help with that. Uh, but some of the other things that I was able to do while the DSA treasurer uh, included things like helping to uh, budget for a conference. So that was an exciting thing to do, an exciting way to kind of grow my skills uh, because we were able to, you know, get the money in from the people attending the conference. We were also bringing in speakers from other countries on uh, just kind of working through all that paperwork and figuring out like all the work that went into planning a conference was really helpful. And of course, I got to learn more about the different students um, and also the ones that were graduating. And so listening to them and also, you know, getting advice and even like mentorship from them was helpful. Uh, so it was a good time. The next kind of opportunity that came up uh, were conferences. So for the most part, at least kind of like early in my PhD career, um, I chose not to go to a lot of conferences. Uh, and the reason why is because, um, first of all, they cost money. And I wanted to be sure that whatever conference I went to, it was somewhere where I was definitely going to be presenting. Because if I wasn't, you know, doing something like that, then I didn't want to just go just like purely to network. So for me, for the most part, when I was a PhD student, it wasn't until like the very end that I really went to a lot of conferences. One opportunity though that I did uh, choose to pursue though was teaching. And the way I ended up teaching was because when I was LISA president, uh, the advisor for LISA at that time was Dr. Kay Castle. And she enjoyed working with me, you know, when I was president, she was faculty, you know, I tried to make sure she knew what was going on and like took her advice on things. So when she needed a teaching assistant or a TA, she asked me if I was interested. And this was actually for the reference course. And I said, well, you know, I've never worked, you know, at the reference desk, technically. She's like, well, you answer questions at the circulation desk. And I'm like, yes, this is actually true. And it's also true that sometimes when I was working, like on a Sunday, there was no reference librarian on duty for at least the first few hours. Uh, so I actually, you know, knew a little bit about answering questions. And just kind of taking that first step was a little scary, but she was right. I did know some, a little bit about teaching or at, little, at least a little bit about teaching people how to use the library. Um, it was a great way to kind of uh, get practice to start giving lectures, uh, to start grading. Um, I got to meet all the other teachers and kind of see them in a different light because sometimes when you're a student like you see a teacher a certain way but then when you start teaching yourself and you're starting to ask them for advice um, and mentorship then you know you get to know them a little more and you realize that they're also human and you know working with people like Kay uh, I TA'd with for her for actually a few classes because first it kind of started with reference and then it moved to like government documents and collection development um, I was really able to learn a lot. And then even I was able to get my own class as a PhD student. Uh, first, 
course I ever taught was actually reference. And actually it's one I'm teaching now and I'll be teaching in the summer. So that was great. Another opportunity that came my way that I chose to pursue uh, happened with regard to research. Um, my area of study was academic library value because I felt that it was something that was flexible enough that if I wanted to work as uh, an academic librarian or as a researcher, there was going to be plenty of work. I think that librarianship and education, they're very closely related uh, because the point of you know the LS profession is to kind of help create you know an informed population or informed community. The purpose of education is to create an educated community and being educated and informed are actually you know very similar. One of the big trends that we were seeing in education was actually this move towards assessment. So it wasn't enough that you know students were learning something on you know they were being graded by a certain standard. Um, you know, if you've been going to school or you have children that are in school, I'm sure you know about like No Child Left Behind, you know about things like Common Core. And just the idea that, you know, you need to be, there needs to be like more accountability. So I felt that, you know, studying library value was useful uh, because then, you know, instead of just being one of those teachers that, you know, just has to do the things for accountability, research could actually say, okay, school or whoever might say it, this is how we want you to be responsible or accountable but wouldn't it be better if we were the ones saying this is how we should be held accountable so I thought that it was an exciting opportunity to kind of help the profession in that way with ACRL and OCLC ACRL is a association of college and research libraries OCLC is um, online computer learning center ACRL had put out a call uh, there had been a document called Value of Academic Libraries and it was a really, you know, helpful document because it said these are the ways that academic libraries are proving their value. And it gave kind of like a way to start researching, it gave questions to ask, it gave even just basic definitions of what library value was and how to measure it. And for me, you know, learning about it, I was like, wow, this is really exciting. About five years after that, uh, was published, then they said, you know, it's been some time and we want to see specifically a research agenda for how libraries are helping students succeed. So at the time, I was, you know, farther in my academic career. Uh, Marie had, Marie Radford, you know, that's one of the areas that she studied. And she also had a colleague, uh, Lynn Solopini Conaway, who was on my uh, dissertation committee and who knew a lot about, you know, the value of academic libraries. So, you know, we got together and we brought in another doctoral student who's now a professor down at the University of South Carolina. Her name's Vanessa Kitsi. And we were like, well, we think that we have a good idea for this project. Uh, but what we did, proposed was super ambitious. First of all, we wanted to interview uh, people both in higher education and also librarians. So there is that component. We also said, you know, let's go even farther uh, because we want something that's going to be super helpful. We want people not just to like read kind of like the book and see what research there is, but we want them to be able to interact with the data and to be able to tell their own story. And so we decided it would be great to create a database uh, that had these different value studies that people could look at and they could see what other people had done. They could see kind of like the studies they did and what populations they studied. And then that would help them inform their own research. And then we also wanted to do something, you know, with visualization, we wanted to be kind of between Tableau and Microsoft Excel, because with Excel, you can do like, you know, some bar charts and stuff. But with Tableau, you could do a whole lot more with visualization. Uh, the thing is, though, that Tableau is expensive. And so that was that was kind of scary uh, because, you know, I'd never really written code. Uh, but the good thing was that Lynn knew someone who was a great computer programmer. Uh, and we were able to come up with that report, we proposed it, and it was accepted. Uh, so it was something that I knew about library value because I had studied it, but it allowed me to kind of expand my skills uh, and to really do a project of a scope that I had never done before, writing a large report for, you know, the Association of College and Research Libraries. And it was great for networking, of course. Uh, but then, once again, the most important part is that working with my team, you know, we really trust 
each other. We really trusted people that we were working with. So that I think was probably one of the things that gave me the most confidence uh, moving forward to other opportunities. And that opportunity presented itself uh, when a job opening came for the John Cotton Dana Library. So it was just as I was finishing, you know, my PhD, this job appeared and it seemed like it was almost written for me. Uh, and I asked, and I don't think it necessarily was, but you know, Rutgers is a small place, so it's possible. And the idea is that they wanted a librarian to do user engagement and also assessment. So that was pretty much like right in my skill set uh, because it was measuring the value of the academic library at an institution that I was very familiar with, Rutgers University. One thing that I was a little concerned about though was that it was a tenure track, uh, sorry, a non-tenure track position. Um, and it was only a one year contract. And at that point in my career, well, if you work for the state of New Jersey, you know that if you want to vest in PERS, you got to put in 10 years. I was like a little over nine. So as long as they didn't fire me right away, I figured I'd be okay to like, you know, get the pension. But then I was a little unsure of what to do after that. Um, and if anything, that was kind of like my biggest kind of concern about taking this job because I was very safe and pretty successful at my staff job. And I knew that I could just kind of wait until something better came along. So big question really was figuring out, you know, is this going to be a supportive network? It's a new position. Am I going to be out there alone just trying to like make the best of like what's out there? Or is it something that I'm really going to be able to grow into? Well, I wasn't really sure, even though, you know, I've worked at Rutgers because the Newark and Dana sorry, the Newark and Camden campuses, that sometimes they just kind of did their own thing. Um, but I'd heard good things in general about the Dana librarians. And when I went to interview, it was funny. There was sort of a comedy of errors before the actual interview. And what happened was I had gotten there, you know, a good 10 minutes early and like I was waiting for them, but they didn't have the table. Uh, so 10 minutes after the dinner was supposed to start, we finally figured out that they had actually been waiting 20 minutes before you know, so they were like, oh, she's late. But really, no, we were all just confused. By the time I got to the table, uh, it was at a very nice Portuguese restaurant. And they had already drank one, you know, bottle sangria. And I was like, okay, well, I guess they, you know, like to party. But actually, I could also see they were kind of tired. So I was like, you know, what happened? And they're like, oh, you, you would not believe this, but there was a leak and all of a sudden water started gushing like, you know, in one of our rooms that had a lot of like, you know, special rare collections. And so everyone in the library started pitching in and like, it's like the director was there. Everyone on the whole committee had been like, you know, trying to save these, this collection from the water. And I was like, you know, working at the Alexander Library, if you ever have the chance to visit once the pandemic lifts, if you go up to the third floor, you're going to see a lot of plastic up there. That's was a temporary solution, but it's become permanent because we're constantly getting leaks up there. And I thought it was something, you know, for the director of the library, like herself to be, you know, helping uh, to, you know, take care of the collections. And I thought, you know what, I think I can see myself here. So working as a librarian uh, was, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I had a great time kind of getting to say, to be the first one in a position. And even though it was scary, like I said, I felt like I had a pretty good handle on what to do. And because I felt like I had more to say, you know, I ended up going to more conferences. Some of the conferences, I wasn't sure if, you know, I was best qualified, but for the most part, it met my other three criteria pretty well. One thing though, that uh, kind of dropped by the wayside was teaching. And that was just because it was confusing, you know, as a teacher, um, what happens when I was a staff member, it was pretty easy to get paid outright, but when you're working at a library or professionally, sometimes it can be difficult and usually you're not even allowed to get paid directly for something that your job is already paying for you to do. And that's true if you work in academia or if you work for the government. Um, so in this case, you know, I wasn't sure, you know, how much of the money I would get if I would be able to use it for my own research. So at that point, you know, I wasn't, feeling super supportive with the teaching, so I stopped teaching for a while. But 
something, another opportunity came to be involved in a student organization, and this is the Rutgers University School of Communication Information Alumni Association. Uh, so actually, Marie asked me if I was interested in being a secretary, and even though I was like, well, I don't really know what, like, you know, I need to do as a secretary. Hopefully, I don't have to do anything with the web page. Unfortunately, I didn't, um, but it turned out it overall was a pretty good fit, and the good thing about being in the alumni association is that once you graduate, you're all, you're going to be part of it automatically, but you don't have to pay for it or anything, and you can stay involved. Uh, you know, you can figure out what's happening at Rutgers, and then they also have events where you get to network with other alumni. So if you have, so when you graduate, you know, please take the time to, you know, join and figure out what's going on there. I know they also post a lot of jobs on their uh, Facebook site as well, so that can be helpful. And then finally, the opportunity uh, to become a data analyst at the library opened. At this point, it had been a couple of years, um, you know, at, at Rutgers, and I was still concerned about the whole like, non-tenure track thing. I could see things that were coming down the line, and I was a little unsure, so I kind of wanted to see what else was out there. One of the things I started looking into was federal jobs, um, because some of my mentors recommended for me. Uh, they were like, well, you know, you have a PhD, um, so you're not limited to just librarianship, you know, you can look into other data related careers. And when I saw the job for the Library of Congress, I mean, who's going to say no to the Library of Congress, even though ironically, I'm not working as a librarian. And when I went to that interview, I was actually kind of funny because it was me and uh, the panel was three lawyers. And I was like, well, I know a lot about libraries. And they're like, that's great. We really need someone who communicate with the librarians. Uh, and, you know, just telling them how I work through different problems. Um, so one of like my, I said my major accomplishments, and I understand if you don't think it's like super impressive. When I started at the Dana Library, we had five different forms for collecting reference stats, five. Depending on which desk you were at, and kind of like the time of day, you used a different form, and all the different forms, of course, were different. So we had no real way of like tracking reference across the system. And it took a year for me to, you know, talk to librarians and convince them and to like go to different parties and say, oh, you know, I think we can combine the forms. I think it should look like this. But, you know, after a year of working with them, we actually ended up with one. And they're like, no, that's actually really impressive um, because there are some things we been trying to do at the library and we haven't been able to get anything done. So I was like, okay, I think that seems like a good fit. And that's how I ended up at the Library of Congress. So to end, I just want to give a few takeaways. Um, I guess like kind of the summary of uh, this presentation. I told you a little about, you know, my path and how I kind of like the opportunities that came, your path is going to be different. Uh, you're not going to have the same opportunities and in some ways that can be good. I hope that you have much better ones, actually. I think that you need to figure out how you're going to navigate those different opportunities. Um, because when you figure out kind of what your values are, or what you're looking for a job or how you want to grow, that will allow you to prioritize what skills you actually want to develop. Um, in general, to be successful at any job, you know, you have to do excellent work. You have to do that work on time. And it's helpful to make it easier for people to like you. The good news is that those three things, you probably only have to do two really well. And then, you know, you'll be successful in almost any job, especially I think working in the library profession. Once you know like what skills you want to develop, then that'll help you know when something is worth the risk and when it's just something that you're going to want to pass on. Another just piece of general advice I want to give is that you have to remember that whatever you did, the skills that you gained that got you to where you are now, that might not get you to the next level. So be great at what you're doing, but also, you know, figure out where you want to expand, what opportunities you want to take that are going to grow your skill set. Uh, so that you can hop to like the next part of your career path. And last but not least, you know, ask questions. The good thing about being a librarian is that people are usually just so willing to like give you advice um, or to give you information. And that translates to, you know, to looking for jobs. So that's all I have for now. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then uh, I'm happy to take your questions.
great, Steph. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, so I'd like to just read them out. Um, so from Marie Radford, um, Steph, can you talk more about the transition from staff position at Alexandra Library to um, being a librarian at Dana? What was it like to make this transition? So in some ways it was pretty easy. Uh, in some ways it was kind of difficult. Uh, kind of the blessing and the curse of, you know, being a staff member, kind of being in like, you know, a lower position and then moving to a higher one is that there are some people that are always going to see you as like being in that lower position. I mean, even though I was like, you know, I was a non-tenure track librarian, but I'm still a librarian. There were some times when like, you know, tenure librarians were ready to like kick me out of rooms that I had booked. And I had to be like, no, I booked this room. I need it for a legitimate class. <laughs> Please go somewhere else. <laughs> And even though they apologized after, it's just thinking like that, where it's like, no, I'm, I'm a librarian too. I, I'm grown up. The good part about, you know, uh, being a staff member is that I had already kind of like, I knew a lot of the people or I knew like the right people to ask. Um, so being an assessment librarian, the first thing I kind of did was just talk to everybody. Cause I was like, look, I know that you take stats. I know you have information because I knew that I want to, when I was a staff member, I also took stats. And then I had information that I'm sure none of the librarians knew about. So that's what I want to hear about. And so it was true. There were things that, you know, they were willing to share with me. And I think that um, it was helpful because I was able to kind of see things from both perspectives. So in that sense, that kind of made it easy. Um, but yeah, the hardest thing was just getting to say, yes, I'm like an, an adult, adult now. I was an adult before, but now I'm like really an adult. And I have a PhD. What else do I need to do for you people? <laughs> yeah. um, also, the fact that I went from a library assistant um, to a librarian was unusual. Uh, not to brag, but every library at least, there's only been definitely one supervisor, who, staff supervisor who became a librarian. And I think that there was someone in technical services uh, who also made the switch from staff to faculty. But other than that, um, it was just kind of me. So it's not super, I would not recommend, you know, being a staff member trying to get a faculty position. It's difficult. You're probably gonna have to go somewhere else. But even, you know, getting a library job because there's so much competition in the New Jersey, New York area, you might have to go somewhere else anyway. Hopefully that answers your question, Marie. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, good information. Um, so you mentioned your concerns about taking the job at Alexander since you hadn't uh, had previous library experience. Do you have any, any advice for students looking for their first library jobs? So for me, actually not knowing anything was helpful <laughs> uh, because if I had probably known more and realized that my staff experience might not necessarily translate to my library, uh, professional, you know, library experience, I might have decided instead of taking a job to try to do more things to kind of like do actual like librarian work, you know, that would have like counted. Uh, but for me, getting the job at Rutgers, especially because I knew that they were going to pay for my tuition, uh, made it a lot easier. Mm. So with your first library job, I think the good thing is that uh, you won't really know what to expect. Um, so that's why I recommend definitely looking for that uh, supportive environment. Uh, and actually kind of one of the things about this whole pandemic, um, whenever I went on an interview in order to find out if this was gonna be like a supportive environment, when they asked, do you have any questions? One of the questions I always ask, well, what do you like most about the job? And most of the time they say the people, and that, that's great. But sometimes when they say the people, they'll say it's the people in spite of blah, blah, blah. And you really want to pay attention to the blah, 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 because that's like the thing that they don't really want to tell the person interviewing, but that's probably, you know, the main concern with the organization. Having been through this pandemic, we know that there's a whole range of responses that libraries have given. I mean, some places closed immediately, some like a lot of precautions to make sure their staff didn't get infected. Some people, some organizations made sure that uh, people weren't furloughed or laid off and not just the professional staff, but also the paraprofessional staff. 
So I think that if you're on the job market and you're getting kind of like a good vibe about this and you really want to figure out like what this organization values and how decisions are made uh, in these times of uncertainty, I think you should definitely ask, you know, what was your library's response to the pandemic? How were decisions made? Um, because I think that's really going to tell you everything you're going to want to know about how they treat people and what their values are. Right. And going off of what you just said about the pandemic, um, can you talk to us a little bit about how this virus ha uh, has impacted your professional career? Or what are some takeaways from this experience as we look into the future that might benefit us in a library science career? So, I mean, the obvious thing to take away is that, uh, you know, you just can't tell. <laughs> uh, there is like going to the library profession, I think just, you know, growing up when I did, it's like, there's been a lot of change. I mean, there was like 9-11, uh, there was, you know, the great recession, uh, even like just being at Rutgers, you know, there are major changes there. And so for me, that's why, you know, being flexible and also keeping my options open, uh, but also being careful, like not to kind of spend my energy in too many different ways to really, prioritize and figure out like you know what I need to do to try to take that next step um, has been helpful and I think that things like this pandemic just bring it kind of like into more it makes it more obvious uh, for me personally I've been a lot busier uh, in the pandemic uh, because I help with reporting and you know accountability it's it had been growing but now I feel like it's just like really blossomed like like a huge mushroom, which is good, but it's also bad. If you are in a position to be able to tell your organization's story and show like, you know, what you're able to do, then I think you're going to come out, your organization's going to come out much stronger. If you're not really able to kind of tell that story uh, or tell in a way that it's effective and resonates with uh, your community, but also the people that are funding you, it's going to be a, it's going to be a rough couple of years, you know, moving mm -hmm. forward. So, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, we also have some more uh, questions in the chat. Can you tell us more about which opportunities you chose to pass up? Hmm. So for me, I mean, I think, so you've probably like kind of figured this out, but I'm a pretty conservative person. I mean, even at the tender age of 10, I was like, yeah, college is expensive. I don't want to worry about that debt. <laughs> so for me, uh, I think that for the most part, my first impulse is usually to say no <laughs> to things that come up, uh, unless it's unless I feel comfortable enough, like where I am, to say, okay, yeah, I think I need to expand on something. Um, so for me, it's I do have like a list of things you know that I want to work on, uh, you know, like learn programming, get better at Excel. Um, now it's more like uh, try to work on my communication skills, how to become a more effective teacher. So because of that, uh, it made it easier for me to say, okay, is this opportunity going to help me like stretch like to a, like comfortably so that I'll grow? Or is it just going to like zap all my strength because it's something I'm already really good at or something that's just going to take way too much energy for me to get like decent at? Uh, I guess, you know, specific opportunities that I passed up. For the most part, I mean, I think it was conferences. Um, but like, really, if I wasn't um, supported financially to go to a conference, for the most part, I said no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's just because, um, for me, networking wasn't really as much of a priority uh, until, like I said, I was farther along in my career and I felt like I had like original research to share. Um, so that's probably like the thing that I would say no to the most. Yeah, and, and teaching. Uh, when I decided to stop teaching, being a librarian, uh, while well, I was a librarian, and that was kind of a difficult decision because I'd been doing it on and off for like, you know, several years already. I enjoy teaching. Um, but just, you know, not knowing like what was going to happen with the pay and then also realizing that, yeah, I think I'm going to be looking for another job. Uh, so I'm going to need time and energy to do that. 
um, that's what made me kind of say no to that opportunity when they ask, hey, do you want to teach a semester? And I'd be like, no, but thanks for the offer and keep me in mind. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to let my co-president take over uh, the rest of the Q&A. Sure. Thanks. Hi, Steph. A um, few more questions here. Um, what courses in the MI program were the most helpful to you in your career? Uh, let's see. Well, I definitely think that um, collection development and the management course were the most helpful. Uh, and that's because they were very practical courses. I think that when we, th when I think about like the skills that uh, MLI students are going to need, or MLI students are going to need to be successful, I think that yes, they need to know like the reference librarian things, or sorry, they need to know about the different resources, our uh, different skills, you know, to be successful, of course. But I think they also need to be successful at you know teaching. And sometimes teaching is not just like I'm the teacher and you're the student and you're going to listen. It's saying, it's really translating. It's saying, so this is what you say you need, but when you're looking for in this sort of information system, this is what you actually are going to need to put in to get there. And it's figuring out ways to explain things so that people can, they're empowered really to find things for themselves. You know, when I was a staff member, I really got to practice that a lot because, you know, you're on the circulation desk, you know, usually at least two, sometimes up to like four to six hours a day. And people come at you with all sorts of different questions, um, especially at the circulation desk, because they want to find that book or they want to find that article. And just so it really gave me uh, the opportunity to kind of practice different ways of like explaining things to people. When I moved into the librarian job, uh, the whole idea was assessment can be kind of scary, right? Because you're saying, well, we want to see how good a job you're doing. But then people are like, well, what if I'm not doing a great job? Or what if I know I'm doing a good job, but it's not the way that you're measuring it. Uh, so for me, it was trying to like, you know, first get people, it's like, okay, I'm not judging you as a person. But really, the thing that we have to do is work together to figure out how we're going to assess ourselves. Because once again, we want to be the ones telling our story and how we're doing the great things. But if we're not telling it in a way that people are listening, it's really not going to matter. Now, as a data analyst, uh, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, now I'm kind of, I can't talk too much about like what I do for the library, uh, but I'm working for the operating office. So it's looking at anything related to personnel, to budget. And we want to be able to tell Congress, you know, you're giving us like this money and this is how, this is what we're doing with it. You know, uh, this is what we're planning on. This is what we actually did. And a lot of them are not library people, you know, but it's kind of getting ourselves out there and saying, no, this is the value that you're getting. So, I don't know, does that help answer, does that answer the question? Yeah, that, it does. And it, you actually touched on the next question, too. Um, so I'm just going to move along it for the sake of time. We want to be mindful of that. Um, mm -hmm. In the field of academic librarianship, um, you mentioned that sometimes a second master's degree is required. Um, is this always the case? For instance, if you'd like to work in a science library, would it be beneficial to have um, a degree in the science field, too? So... It's interesting because I feel like the field of academic librarianship is changing a little bit. If you think about like why we have academic libraries in the first place, it was because institutes of higher learning said, you know, we want to have books so that uh, people can look up and see like what the most current research out there is. And they realized that it would be helpful to have someone who was also an expert in that area to kind of point them to the right books or the right articles, right? And to make sure that those things were purchased for the collection. What I think we're seeing now is a move from the subject experts to people that can also do something like more functional for the library. So for instance, uh, the idea of having a user engagement and assessment librarian, right? So what is their like traditional subject? Um, maybe business or something? There isn't really one defined. Or if you think of like a virtual reference librarian, which was one of the more recent positions that was hired at Rutgers, or you know, a medical education librarian. These are things that, yes, um, it's helpful to have like maybe some higher education in, but it's not strictly just that. So it depends on what type of institution of higher education you want to go to. Uh, 
the other thing we're seeing too is as budgets are kind of constricting, we're getting a lot of people that are sort of like being battlefield promoted. It's like, well, we need a science librarian, but a uh, science librarian left and we don't have the budget to hire one. So who here can do something like science? Um, when I was at the Dana Library, you know, we uh, had slowed down on hiring a bit and some people had retired. So I ended up even being like the nursing librarian. I was like, what did I know about nursing? Nothing. <laughs> Uh, but I was able to learn, and that's the important thing. So, yeah, I would say definitely, like, you know, look at the positions. I mean, it's never too early to start looking at what people are starting to want, um, you know, when they're hiring, and then try to take courses geared to that. But also get, you know, experience where you can, where you can say, um, this is popular in government. Uh, interviews actually. They want you to be able to explain like a situation. They want you to be able to say what you did and then what the outcome was. If you can do things like that, so for different projects, I think in some ways that might, the degree might get you into the interview or into the door, but being able to tell what you did and make it like, you know, understandable and resonate, that's where they're going to say, oh, this is the type of people we want. Because a degree, it's like, it shows you've gotten so far, but then, you know, you also want to show that you can go beyond that. And then if you want to work in some place like a community college, you don't necessarily need, you know, a secondary master's and even some like four year uh, liberal arts universities. So keep that in mind as well. Thank you, that was a very helpful answer. Um, looks like we have one more question for tonight. Um, is there a significant overlap between LIS and data science? Do employers consider those to be different fields? So I have uh, seen hiring from both sides, like both person interviewing and uh, been on a couple committees, but my experience is pretty much only limited to academia and you know the library of congress <laughs> so they know what the difference is <laughs> uh but it, you know once again it depends and it's going to depend on i think kind of the coursework you do uh so for instance if you do like a research project um where you do things that are you know in a library but the project can kind of parlay itself out to more of like a data science uh, perspective, then I think that would work. Um, I said this before, I'll say it again, your degree might get you the interview, but then being able to talk about your actual experience is going to, what's going to get you the job. Uh, I think that most, I think employers would consider both. Um, I don't think that a lot of them, like even in the government, really know what the difference is. Like there's like a defined category for like the librarian job, but usually only people that know they're looking for librarians are going to hire in that category. With analysts, though, or data scientists, um, it's a lot, there's a much wider range of things that, you know, they can do. And a lot of skills, um, such as, you know, starting an assessment program or, you know, measuring things, reporting on certain activities, that's going to translate well for any analyst job. So, I'm actually reading the rest. Would it be difficult to market myself as a data scientist? A data scientist will have a very specific skill set, which would include working with large sets of data and statistics. So if you don't have that experience and you're applying for a specific data, like it, the job says like data scientist, then they're going to know that there's a difference. But it should also be obvious reading the job description, like what sorts of uh, experience or skills you're expected to have. Um, I think that with data science, um, yeah, if you don't know things like, you know, like Python or R uh, or visualization programs like Tableau, um, then you might get the interview, but I don't think it's going to get you the job. Great. Thank you. Um, if you have any parting words or if anyone would like to ask any last questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, 
if there's anything you wanted to go back and visit with this presentation, we are recording it. So it'll be up on our website tomorrow. Um, and just a reminder to everybody that we are also recruiting leadership members for um, the next academic year. So I'm going to go ahead and drop the link to the Google form in the chat if you'd like to check that out, or you can find it on the website too. Um, so Steph, thank you so much for such a great presentation and chatting with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's really an honor. Um, thank you for coming out and, you know, best of luck. If you, you know, have questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, if you're interested in taking reference or collection development and management, I'll be teaching those online during the summer. Uh, so, you know, if, if it's open, be sure to sign up. <laughs> have a nice night. You too. Thank, Thank you so much, everybody.